Welcome everyone to the first session of the Carl Jaspers Society of North America um, session at the Seattle APA meeting. Uh, our session this evening has three speakers and after each speaker Mario Wenning will be um, giving a brief reply uh, following which we'll have a short time for questions and answers and discussion. So. Um, Without further delay, let me introduce our first speaker, Edmund E. from University of Macau, will be reading his paper called Wisdom in Aristotle and Aquinas, From Metaphysics to Mysticism. Thank you, and good afternoon to all. Um, I, I must begin with first an, an apology, because um, uh, I, I'm guilty of uh, false advertising. Um, it, it happened that um, I, I modified the, the paper slightly. I, I, I was planning to do a a paper that was uh, intercultural between um, Christian mysticism and uh, Confucian mysticism, but I, I was unable to to fit all that material into one paper, so I had to restrict myself to just one half of it. So it, it's still going to be comparative in in this uh, in this approach, but it just won't be uh, intercultural in in the approach. So the the the, the paper is 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 titled uh, Wisdom in Aristotle and Aquinas. And what I do actually is to um, examine the concept of wisdom uh, as found in Aristotle as an intellectual virtue. And then I, I trace how Thomas Aquinas understands this intellectual virtue and he translates it into uh, the gift of wisdom as a gift of the Holy Spirit. And I want to see how uh, uh, metaphysical knowledge is. Uh, evolves into uh, mystical knowledge you know, in the hands of uh, St. Thomas. And I, I do this by first going to the Nicomachean Ethics, Book 6, and then I will just uh, make the transition by looking at Aquinas' commentary on the Ethics, and then I will go immediately to the Summa Theologiae to look at the question on wisdom. And then if I have time, then I will, I will say a few words about uh, some application or notions of wisdom uh, for uh, application. And so I, I begin with a definition of wisdom, uh, and I understand wisdom to be a, a state of union with the divine. And this union is achieved by contemplation. And so there's, there's a belief in the power of the human being to, to gain access to ultimate reality through knowledge. Uh, However, this knowledge is not uh, attained by some mundane thought processes. And so we begin immediately with uh, Aristotle on wisdom. So Aristotle understands wisdom as one of the intellectual virtues. And in his case, intellectual virtue is the habit of the soul uh, by which the truth is expressed by affirmation or denial. And as we all know, uh, for him, there are five intellectual virtues. Art, science, prudence, wisdom, and understanding. Now, one particular point that I want to highlight is this, that uh, Aristotle understands uh, wisdom as the most perfect mode of knowledge, uh, this metaphysical knowledge. And he has a, has a peculiar way of looking at this intellectual virtue. That is that it is a combination of science and understanding. So wisdom includes two aspects, uh, science and understanding. And the other point that uh, I'd like to move to is Aristotle's conception of happiness. So for Aristotle, happiness is not a disposition. It is not, a, it is not a, a, an emotional state because uh, if if happiness were a disposition, then someone who was sleeping or someone who was unconscious or someone who was uh, suffering great misfortune could be considered happy. But for, for him, happiness must be some kind of activity. And so, uh, happiness is an activity in accordance with virtue. And happiness is acting in accordance with the highest virtue. And for him, uh, happiness is attained by contemplating. 
And so contemplation in accordance with its perfect virtue is uh, happiness. And this is how we, we derive uh, the, no the notion of um, uh, the highest form of knowledge giving us the, the good life. And uh, in particular, in Book 10 of the Ethics, no? um, Aristotle tells us that, that God is perfectly happy and therefore God's activity must be contemplation. And so the, 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 the idea is that the nature of human happiness must also consist of the activity of contemplation. So, so here we have a, a very brief account of how Aristotle sees wisdom as an intellectual virtue and how contemplation uh, gives us this form of uh, metaphysical knowledge. So I go on now to uh, Aquinas' uh, commentary on Aristotle. So Aquinas wants to explain to us why Aristotle says that wisdom includes the virtue of science and the virtue of understanding. So Aquinas says that uh, understanding deals with demonstration, but wisdom deals with being. Uh, another way of saying it is that understanding deals with the principles of demonstration, while wisdom deals with the principles of being. And so I have a quotation here. So wisdom in declaring the truth about principles is understanding. But wisdom in knowing the things inferred from the principles is science. However, wisdom is distinguished from science you know, by reason of the eminence which it has among other sciences. It is a kind of perfection of all sciences. So here, uh, using uh, Aquinas' commentary on Aristotle, on the ethics, um, he explains why uh, uh, Aristotle has this uh, peculiar way of looking at um, the virtue of, of wisdom. And furthermore, uh, according to Aquinas, wisdom is an object of choice in itself because it is an intellectual virtue which perfects the rational part of the soul. So anything which is, is an object of choice by reason of its perfection. And so uh, Aquinas gives us some detail about uh, the connection between wisdom and happiness. So uh, for him, uh, I'm quoting here, Wisdom is not compared to happiness in the same way as the medical art is to health, but rather as health to healthful activities. So wisdom is compared to, to happiness, like health is compared to uh, healthy activities. The, the difference is this. Uh, medical art brings about health through an external work, but health brings about healthy activities by use of the habit of health. So, uh, w uh, wisdom works to produce happiness in, in some interior way, not in some uh, exterior way. Happiness is not a work externally produced by an operation proceeding from the habit of virtue. Since, w since wisdom is a certain species of a virtue as a whole, it follows that from the very fact that a man has wisdom and operates according to it, he is happy. So here we see um, Aquinas uh, explaining uh, Aristotle's position. So now I will move on to uh, Aquinas' main text, which is the, the Summa Theologia, and I'm looking at the uh, Secunda Secunde, the second part or second part, the question on wisdom. And so, uh, here Aquinas, in a sense, translates uh, Aristotle's notion of wisdom as an intellectual virtue into the gift of wisdom, which uh, is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And so in the, in the Christian medieval tradition, there are seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. No? Wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, then fortitude, piety, and fear of the Lord. So for, for Aquinas, uh, Wisdom is just one of these gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so he, he interprets uh, 
wisdom, this mystical knowledge in this sense. And so for Aquinas, one uses wisdom to know the highest cause. And knowledge of the highest cause enables one to judge all the other causes. And so for him, the highest cause is God. And when the highest cause is understood, then one is able to judge and order everything according to the divine precepts. And so for, for Aquinas, uh, wisdom is connected with the act of judging. To be able to judge everything in, uh, in relation to the, to the highest cause. And so Aquinas explains that uh, the virtue of wisdom is natural, while the, the gift of wisdom is supernatural. So he says, the, the wisdom which is called a gift of the Holy Ghost differs from that which is an acquired intellectual virtue. For the latter is attained by human effort, whereas the former is descending from above. And Aquinas takes care to explain the difference between wisdom and faith. Because uh, in, in the Summa, uh, Aquinas sees uh, the gift of wisdom as being connected to the, the virtue of charity. So in, in, the, in the second part, or the second part, the secunda secunde, there are uh, seven uh, virtues, that the, the, the three theological virtues and the four cardinal virtues. So faith, hope, and charity, and then uh, prudence, justice, uh, fortitude and temperance, so four cardinal virtues. So for, for, for Aquinas, uh, wisdom is connected with the virtue of charity and not faith, you know? even though it, it produces a kind of knowing and judging, but it's not, it's not uh, under faith. So he explains this. Wisdom differs from faith, since faith ascends to the divine truth in itself whereas it belongs to the gift of wisdom to judge according to the divine truth. Hence, the gift of wisdom presupposes faith, because a man judges well what he knows. And so, for in, in the Summa, judging is understood in two ways. No? Uh, one judges rightly by the use of reason, and one can judge rightly by having some affinity with the, with the subject matter. So Aquinas writes, Accordingly, it belongs to the wisdom that is an intellectual virtue to pronounce right judgment about divine things after reason has made its inquiry. So this is wisdom as intellectual virtue. But it belongs to wisdom as a gift of the Holy Ghost to judge a right about them on account of connaturality with them. And so uh, the intellectual virtue of wisdom allows one to make judgments by reasoning. But the, the gift of wisdom is that, uh, is that power that judges by having some affinity with the subject matter. So Aquinas has this uh, uh, exposition about the, the gift of wisdom. So it is both speculative and practical. So for, for him, wisdom is speculative because the intellect considers the divine ideas in God. Meaning that the intellect contemplates you know, the divine ideas. He gets this notion from Aristotle. But wisdom is also practical because uh, the intellect consults the divine ideas in God and judges human acts according to the divine precepts. So, uh, wisdom is primarily speculative and secondarily practical. And also, wisdom cannot exist together with sin because uh, wisdom is caused by charity. We saw that uh, the gift of wisdom is, is considered under the, the virtue of charity. It's a, it's a theological virtue. And charity cannot exist with mortal sin. And so, uh, in, the, in Aquinas' account, every, uh, every Christian who, who is free from mortal sin and in a state of grace has wisdom. 
And so all believers in a state of grace have the ability to contemplate the divine realities and to order their acts according to the divine precepts. So everybody has this. Every believer has this. However, this kind of this wisdom as a kind of mystical knowledge has degrees. So uh, Aquinas believes that some people have a higher degree of wisdom, and this is expressed in two ways. First, those with a higher degree of wisdom are better at contemplating the divine realities. This means that they are able to know the higher mysteries of faith, and they are able to teach this knowledge to others. Another way of having a higher degree of wisdom is that some people are better at ordering human acts according to divine precepts. This means that they are able to order their own acts as well as order other people's actions. And so, now I just make a, a brief summary of the, the whole process and then I'll conclude with two remarks. So we saw how Aquinas received the concept of wisdom as metaphysical knowledge in contemplation from Aristotle. And then he developed the theological concept of wisdom as mystical knowledge, you know, knowledge of the divine ideas and the divine precepts. So for Aristotle, wisdom is the perfect mode of knowledge. It combines science and understanding. And the virtue of wisdom is an object of choice in itself. And it is the virtue which perfects the rational part of the soul. Aquinas explains that wisdom is understanding when it expresses knowledge about the first principles. Wisdom is science when it expresses knowledge by inference from first principles. This is what enables judging, when we are able to, to express inference from first principles. And wisdom is also a form of perfect knowledge. So in, in the Summa, Sacred doctrine is the highest wisdom because sacred doctrine deals with God as the highest cause which uses both philosophy and revelation. And uh, the virtue of wisdom differs from the gift of wisdom in three ways. The, the virtue of wisdom is natural and acquired by human effort, while the gift of wisdom is uh, given by God and is supernatural. Uh, wisdom refers to an ability to make right judgments according to divine precepts. So judging rightly can be done by reasoning or by some affinity with the matter to be judged. And the gift of wisdom is superior to the virtue of wisdom because it allows the human soul to be united to God, you know, to, the, to the divine reality. And so I, I just want to finish by, I just want to finish by making two remarks about uh, Aquinas' understanding of uh, wisdom. The first is uh, an application of understanding St. Augustine's precept. You know? Those of us who are from a Christian background will know about this. You know? uh, 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 Augustine has this famous saying, love and do what you will. You know? uh, love and do what you will, whatever you hold your peace, through love, hold your peace. When you cry out, through love, cry out. When you correct, through love, correct. And so, uh, in Aquinas' understanding of wisdom, uh, charity unites the, the love of God, unites the, the soul of the believer to God. And charity causes wisdom. And so, uh, there's a connection between wisdom and charity in Aquinas. It helps us understand uh, the, the connection between loving and doing the right thing. Um, the, the, the second remark is this. Uh, it's a question about uh, leadership. You know? um, uh, for example, in, in the church, you know, the uh, bishops are expected to be people who are of good morals, piety, zeal for souls, wisdom, and the other virtues. And so, uh, Aquinas' understanding of wisdom can help us to, to see why uh, this is important for a church leader. Because a church leader who is wise means that uh, 
is someone who, who is able to, to know about the divine mysteries and teach others about it and also to order their lives and other people's lives. Thank you. So now Mario Wenning is going to give a brief response. Yes, I will keep my comments short and just focus on one moment. Um, Edmund is reflection on wisdom and the Nicomachean ethics as well as in Thomas Aquinas. Commentary are audacious in that they include thinkers in the mystical canon that are usually not regarded as mystics. The paper presupposes that mysticism consists in a state of union with the divine achieved through contemplation. For reasons of time, I will not address whether the specifically monotheistic, perhaps ex exclusively Christian, notion of mysticism can be applied to non-monotheistic traditions. Rather, I will turn to an issue mentioned in the paper that strikes me as particularly fruitful for the project of rethinking mysticism, namely the connection between wisdom and mysticism. So um, the focus on wisdom as a means of mystical achievement suggests that the mystical union with the divine is not only not opposed to cognition, but depends on it. Mysticism for Aquinas is made possible through contemplation and insight rather than taking leave from reason. Edmund demonstrates that an essential addition to Aristotle's conception of wisdom made by Thomas Aquinas is that wisdom is not only a natural virtue with moral and intellectual components, but also a divine gift. What kind of gift is wisdom? There are at least three dimensions in which the notion of gift could be employed to characterize the mystically fruitful virtue of wisdom. First, wisdom, as much as it can be cultivated, is not a faculty that humans have created by themselves and freely dispose over. Secondly, in Edmund's reading, the gift of wisdom presupposes a giver and a recipient. And thirdly, the recipient of the gift, the donné or uh, présenté, takes on certain responsibilities qua having received the gift. While I want to leave the contentious question of whether gifts um, presuppose a giver aside, I would like to hear more from Edmund about what is involved in receiving the gift of wisdom. I take it that insights into the highest ends of knowledge and action depend on intuition, and this is why you call it a gift. What kinds of responsibilities, though, arise from being given rather than being the author of such insights? If the gift, as Edmund suggests, is being received in a disproportionate degree by particularly gifted church leaders who disseminate the gift through their leadership to less gifted believers, in what sense are the disciples, or even the leaders for this matter, free to receive or deny this gift? In other words, does the notion of the gift of wisdom contradict individual freedom or choice? That seems to me to be necessary for a convincing theory um, of epistemic and moral responsibility that we think about how to combine these two um, and connect uh, these two notions of freedom on the one hand and the gift of wisdom on the other. Um, this leads to a second related concern. Gifts are not always good or even wanted. They can be an imposition and a burden. For Aquinas, by contrast, the gift of wisdom does not belong into this category since it opens up the path to perfect beatitude or perfect happiness. My question to Edmund is whether he considers the transition from Aristotle's concept of eudaimonia to the Thomistic notion of perfect beatitude convincing. Aristotle was careful not to claim that the practice of virtue, including the highest virtue of wisdom, would lead to perfect happiness. We should, he argued, consider humans blessed with happiness only in so far as happiness applies to human beings, ut hominus. There are good reasons to follow Aristotle in remaining cautious about aligning wisdom with perfect happiness. As Aristotle emphasizes, human modes of existence, including contemplative life, remain dependent on external goods and are thus always subject to potential frustrations. In a world of contingency and flux, prudence and judgment become indispensable. Do you, Edmund, agree with Aquinas that the wise person is indeed happy 
in an absolute sense or strives for happiness in an absolute sense, or is Aristotle's weaker claim that humans can only approximate human happiness more viable? If we side with Aristotle, it seems to me that consolation, contentment, or even the virtue of hope that you mentioned might be better candidates to characterize the state of mind that the mystic can indeed achieve. Absolute happiness seems neither a realistic nor a desirable goal for mystics as well as other humans. So Edmund will now give a brief response and after that we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Thank you for the, for the comments. No? Um, uh, just maybe I'll pick up two points that I thought were, were the, the major um, uh, criticisms of the, the paper. So the, the first thing that I, I, I thought of was uh, uh, the question of receiving wisdom as a gift. So in the, in the theological tradition, um, uh, wisdom as a gift of the Holy Spirit is, is given at, at baptism. And so it's a gift that is given to, to all believers. And so um, I, I, I see this more positively in a sense that it is a, a kind of democrati democratization of wisdom uh, in, in the sense that in Aristotle, he, he, would, he would say that only some people could, could have the leisure and the education to, to pursue philosophy and attain wisdom. But in the theological tradition, uh, wisdom is, is in principle open to, to everybody who, who believes. And so uh, I, I think that um, this will be an important implication for uh, the claim of uh, mystical knowledge. And the other point that I wanted to uh, respond to would be the connection between happiness and beatitude. Because uh, this, this is a major topic that is treated in the Summa. Um, the, the transition from um, uh, eudaimonia to beatitudo. And so this, this really is um, the, uh, the contentious point. You know? So for, for Aquinas, uh, happiness can be the result of human effort, but uh, beatitude is, uh, is again you know, uh, connected to, to grace and is, uh, is, given, uh, as a, as is, is given by the, the Creator. And it, it, it cannot be um, it cannot be accomplished by human effort alone, even though human effort is is involved. Okay, thank you, Edmund. Questions or comments, or discussion points from anyone? Thanks, Edmund. Uh, it was a great paper. I just have one quick question. Why does this particular tradition consider wisdom um, as generating knowledge? Um, uh, the the Thomistic tradition tend to tended to to stress reason, while the I mean, meaning the the Dominican tradition, which which is what Thomas Aquinas came from, uh, uh, it, it, in in his uh, school of uh, theology, he tend to stress reason, while the Franciscan tradition, so like thinkers like Bonaventure, tend to stress the will, and so um, those uh, those thinkers that that stress the notion of the will. Uh, with regard to, to charity would, uh, would, would stress um, uh, uh, in those, who, those thinkers that stress the will would stress charity but and those thinkers that stress reason would, would stress knowledge and so uh, uh, taking from uh, Aristotle Aquinas would stress the epistemic uh, component of, of wisdom and he, he, take, he takes it from Aristotle that um, by having understanding, one is able to accomplish certain acts of judging for the purpose of uh, salvation. Could you say something at all briefly about the link between wisdom and happiness? Because it give you an alternative view. Uh, for instance, a 20th century view for many, but it goes way back uh, that wisdom goes along with resignation. That is not so much happiness as a uh, calm, neo-stoic recognition of the tragedies of life and a certain uh, inward calm and resolve to cope with them. It, it, it seems that 
um, from a more existentialist point of view, um, happiness is a kind of resignation in this life because we live in, shall we say, absurd uh, situations. You know, we we are frustrated by what we what we want to be, but we cannot attain that which we wish, or we we seek certain um, outcomes but are unable to attain them. But um, uh, in, in, in my understanding, um, what Aristotle is really saying is that um, wisdom is to know your place in the world, um, to know uh, where the human being is supposed to, uh, to flourish and, and live out you know, uh, our, our purpose in this life. And, then, and so the one who knows his or her place in life you know, uh, acts accordingly and lives, lives the, the life fully. And uh, this way, you will not feel frustrated when when you do not accomplish what uh, you you have not succeeded, you know, because you, you have found your place in life. And in in Aquinas's view, it, it will be something uh, shall we say more uh, mystical in a sense of supernatural. That um, happiness is living according to divine precepts, you know, applying the divine precepts into one's daily life in order to to live a, a good life in, in this world. When it seems that uh, these connections you're talking about uh, have to be highly contextualized because in Eastern traditions, say for example in Mahayana Buddhism of the Madhyamaka variety, wisdom is the ability to help other people not take their own views too seriously. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a talent for uh, showing um, that you shouldn't be so attached to your everyday ideas uh, because there, uh, there are certain problems with them that, that, that you know, very much in sort of the style of Socrates. Uh, and and so, uh, so wisdom helps one in one's meditation to uh, silence one's mental mode so that one can achieve mystical experience, a nirvana experience, which is not mental. That's, uh, that's quite right. Um, um, Aquinas comes from the, the Christian and therefore the, the Western tradition uh, of medieval philosophy. Um, but I would like to make a, this, just a quick remark uh, that um, uh, in, in, in the Summa, Aquinas is very clear that um, actually the things that we know about God are much fewer than the things that uh, we don't know about God. And so wisdom is also part of uh, this, this notion where we, we, we are aware of our own ignorance before the divine reality. And, and, being, and knowing our place in this world, in this sense, makes us uh, live a good life, uh, to, to become wise. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker will be Stephen A. Erickson of um, Pomona College. And the topic he'll be speaking on is Intuition, Worlds, and Transcendence, the Eroding Foundations of Spiritual Experience. I should say from the start that I'll be uh, largely exploratory and thereby, I think, a bit provocative in what I'm going to suggest. I'd like to start uh, by a relation that I believe does exist and maybe needs to exist between mysticism and foundationalism. And by foundationalism, I mean the view, of course, that the anti-foundationalists of our time have been attacking. Uh, it's a view that is very, very closely related to the axial the axial, as I will understand it now, uh, requires a distinction between appearance and reality, uh, bondage and liberation, confusion and insight, uh, at least metaphorically, between this world and another. The only part of my paper that I'm going to read uh, is just a few succinct remarks about foundationalism. Foundationalism. For someone to qualify as being a foundationalist, I suggest that a minimum that person must adhere to 
are the following theses. One, that a fundamental bifurcation separates appearance from reality. Two, that reality is that upon which appearance rests. Three, that reality itself is not accessible by normal everyday means, nor by discursive analytical means either. And four, that contact with reality not only sheds light on why and how appearances are as they are, but that such contact is potentially transformative, theologically stated that it is potentially redemptive. Well, there, for a start, a short and succinct count of the notion of foundationalism. I will suggest, again, somewhat provocatively, that uh, uh, in many ways what we want to think of and explore as mysticism requires a kind of foundationalist stratum uh, as uh, the basis for the activity of the mystic. And I will suggest further that on this kind of foundationalist model, mysticism is an avenue beyond appearances to that foundational axial reality. I'll say also, at least from a Western perspective, that uh, reality does very strongly correlate with uh, views of there being a god or gods, the gods of the philosophers closely associated, for example, with Aristotelian thinking, or the gods of or god of religion. Uh, and for this purpose this evening, I will uh, connect that more with Judeo-Christian thinking. The god of the philosophers, the god of philosophy. Uh, on the other hand, we could also eliminate the notion of god or gods for this purpose and say foundationalists believe in something such as being, and I'll leave that deliberately unspecified. Well, uh, I'm on the warpath in this particular paper against modernity. I see modernity, roughly 17th and 18th century philosophy, at least leading into Kant, as a, a kind of halfway house to anti-foundationalist thinking. And I think that that thinking of modernity uh, involves subject-object, inner-outer, interpretation and encounter, and that that kind of bifurcation correlates reasonably well with the foundationalist bifurcation I've mentioned, and that the object is that which is the outer and it is to be encountered. My worry, and again, this is exploratory, uh, is that if you take this modernist turn, you're going to be caught up with some kind of inner representation or experience, something mental, dangerously looking like something subjective. And if the exploratory path of the mystical is to go from that broadly representationalist point of view that is more or less inaugurated by Descartes, mystical investigation or concern may well get trapped in a kind of cabinet of consciousness. Uh, opens itself far more to neurological concerns. Uh, perhaps as a partial remedy to that, not even a halfway one, one can talk about such things as what it means to be a bat and suggest that no objective uh, investigation of this uh, Inter da inner datum is going to be sufficient uh, because it will not get the, and now a word that I think is prob problematic, the subjectivity of it all. Uh, I want to go on a little bit about the notion of encounter. Encounter as being the so-called objective pole or avenue to the objective uh, uh, in a modernist uh, uh, point of view. And I'm going to suggest preliminarily before I go on that encounter we must construe as a kind of undergoing, less an activity as something that we undergo. I think it correlates uh, in the earlier theological tradition very much with uh, suffering. Suffering now 
less as pain as uh, something on, uh, undergone more by a, a patient than by an agent. And I want to point out, secondly, that one of the problems of modernity, I think, from a standpoint of one that would wish to explore in a positive way the mystical, is that uh, certainly the modern tradition, and far more than that tradition, is very caught up in the notion of encounter as sensible encounter. Encounter that uh, is, in a broad sense, by means of the senses, and that that has, in some ways, a uh, uh, restrictive function in the exploration of the mystical. I make a distinction at a certain point in the paper uh, between what I call, maybe a little problematically, uh, epistemological mysticism. Epistemological mysticism being more the study of mysticism from at least a, a, a sort of methodologically skeptical point of view trying to find ways to confirm it. And uh, my suggestion is that epistemological uh, mysticism, uh, an investigative uh, and methodological study, is uh, uh, probably going to need the foundationalist model of the appearance-reality distinction in a very strong way. Uh, I contrast that with what I'm calling existential mysticism. I don't like this word existential for this purpose, but I just didn't come up with a better word. Uh, what I have in mind there is less something that is uh, reflected upon in terms of a theory of knowledge as something that is more lived through uh, and uh, perhaps even at times endured, but yet taken as a way of being uh, more than anything else. And this latter, what I'm calling existential mysticism, uh, may well not need foundationalism in any traditional sense. Uh, and it may lead us uh, in a surprising direction. Well, this is the way I set up the problem in the first half of what is obviously, as with other papers, much longer a paper that can be, than can be presented in uh, 20 minutes. But our strategy, of course, is always to say if you have any objection that uh, it would have been met if we'd been able to read the other two-thirds of the paper. <laughs> this is, a, I think, a tried and true strategy. It uh, comes close to filibuster as being a good way to <laughs> solve uh, contentious issues. Now, as a kind of, uh, as I think as it's uh, called, uh, a heads up, uh, I'm going to say that if you have this subject-object model, this inner-outer model, uh, this uh, interpretation-encounter model, and if it becomes uh, mental material because you have a sensible receptivity and therefore a sensibleist notion of what's out there, uh, this is going to be very problematic uh, for uh, mystical uh, investigation. I'm going to go now somewhat abruptly to saying something about Kierkegaard. Let me start by stating and reminding those many of us who already have tread this ground a bit uh, about what Kierkegaard says about an absolute relationship to the absolute, something he says a lot about in a number of places, concluding unscientific postscripts as one. Uh, well, he talks about this as a very personal relationship that's at least a possibility. Uh, we learn from his philosophical fragments that he says uh, it doesn't work as a belief system uh, because uh, the paradox of the theological message that Kierkegaard lives within is that uh, it ultimately doesn't add up. It's not a rational position. It's something that is deeply incongruous and even offensive to our reason. If you take Kierkegaard a step further, and in this way he follows the Augustinian tradition, uh, he's very much part of uh, Western theological thinking, even for this relationship to occur, there has to be the, uh, uh, the intervention, the arrival of grace. Grace as something that one cannot concoct on one's own, but one must receive. Now, if we explored this a bit, I think what we'd 
come to think if we took Kierkegaard as a possible example of an alternative model to explore the mystical. We would say that given the necessity of grace supervening from the outside uh, and given the non-rational, not necessarily irrational, but non-rational features of this, uh, what might be involved in what we'll call mystical, at least in the limiting sense of being, on, being beyond rational comprehension, is that one goes, undergoes the relationship, uh, that one lives it, that the mystical in this sense as the non-rational but intimate to one's being would be a mode of being that one lived, not a perception that one verified. Now let me step back before I step forward. Uh, I have some things to say uh, about Jaspers in the paper as well, though in my presentation here I'm going to circumvent those. Uh, one would have been that uh, Jaspers had some interest in Eckhart, a uh, medieval mystic. We know for Eckhart uh, what I'm going to call reality and might have been called God by many was something that Eckhart referred to in various ways as the nothing or simply as nothing or as the divine nothing. Obviously puzzling and odd uh, remarks uh, even for his contemporaries and certainly even more so for those of us who are uh, uh, either children or senior citizens of the 21st century. Uh, now I'm going to flip forward to Wittgenstein in order to hope to illuminate in at least some way uh, uh, this Eckhartian notion of the nothing. Uh, Wittgenstein says, better to call something a nothing than something about which nothing can be said. Um, he also refers to various dimensions of reality as the mystical, and he says, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. This whole notion of the mystical in uh, Wittgenstein isn't absolutely all that stunningly mystical. It's just to say that there are dimensions uh, of uh, our experience that transcend uh, uh, the logical categories or conceptual means by which we uh, can uh, typically and in ways that are repetitive talk about things. So, that in itself is only to indicate that there can be dimensions of reality that are not subject to rational analysis, uh, but they are nonetheless very, very real. Leibniz said that the fundamental question of metaphysics is, uh, why is there something rather than nothing? I want to connect that with uh, a, a complementary question why do we exist, we human beings, rather than not exist? How does that come about? And by the way, in a very recent book by Daniel Dennett that's getting some press now, From Bacteria to Bach and Back, The Evolution of Minds, very explicitly and with uh, true reference, uh, Daniel Dennett refers back to Sellers and a set of issues about how we experience ourselves manifestly, that is, it's a, our world in which we find ourselves, and how a scientific approach might understand how we came to be and why we are as we are. Well, what Sellers says is that on the manifest level, we became humans because we encountered ourselves. And had we not encountered ourselves, we wouldn't have become humans. And if we had encountered ourselves differently, uh, we would have come into being as different kinds of creatures than the humans we came into being as. Uh, call them human sub one or alternative humans, something I guess like alternative facts, uh, which we seem to hear a lot about recently. Now, the paradox, as Sellers sees it, about the doctrine of special creation is that in a way to encounter yourself as a human, you already have to be a human in the first place. 
but to be a human in the first place in order to encounter yourself as human, well, then you wouldn't have to encounter yourself as human because you'd be a human in the first place. Uh, this is a very, very uh, problematic issue. Sellers, philosopher of science, very hard-headed. He saw it as the uh, kind of fundamental problematic feature of any attempt to deny special creation or the notion that there's a dimension of us quite different than any other sort of creature. Uh, as a P.S., Sellers, many, Daniel Dennett, think that eventually over time, science will solve this problem uh, in a way that will be satisfying to everyone. What I want to suggest as I close my remarks now uh, is that uh, if it's true that to be human we must encounter ourselves, uh, but we uh, have to encounter ourselves to be human, but be human in order to encounter ourselves, we seem to come to some foundational level of what it might be actually to be a human that takes us beyond our ordinary perceptual modernist kind of way of framing things in the epistemological tradition. What I'm going to suggest is that uh, a route that might be taken is to think uh, beyond the notion of sensible encounters, uh, to think in terms of the possibility of some kind of transfigured receptivity, and perhaps it might be possible as we go forward uh, that there could be a new role for philosophy if it would be prepared to, uh, uh, if not rethink, at least expand its notion of its options, uh, and that would be to, uh, in some meditative way, explore uh, what it is to be human, what receptive possibilities we have out of which our humanity has arised, and that perhaps out of that it might be possible, again, this is meant as exploratory, I realize uh, somewhat provocative, might be clearer than I present it this evening, but that the mystical as a mode of human being, perhaps a very foundational one, uh, that I've called existential, some would call it ontological, but a way to get beneath uh, the epistemological dilemmas of modernism and the uh, uh, rather uh, relentless attacks by the anti-foundationalists. So that's what I hope to share with you this evening. To take one example, Richard Rorty, whom Stephen cites as the arch anti-foundationalist, um, argues argues for a combination of anti-foundationalism and a secular version of mysticism. Rorty's mysticism remains idiosyncratic and ironic, to be sure. He gives up the search for a ground, for an ultimate ground, that would provide a secure metaphysical basis for knowledge. One consequence of the abandonment of the metaphysics of ultimate grounds is a radically secular, non-foundationalist form of mystical life. In Trotsky and the Wild or Orchids, Rorty recollects the sense of awe that enchanted his childhood when coming across wild flowers. And I quote, in the woods around Fladebrook Will, and especially in the presence of certain coral root orchards and of the smaller yellow lady slipper, I had felt touched by something numinous, something of ineffable importance. End of quote. For Rorty, our public commitment to solidarity and justice does not, or at least not necessarily, overlap with our private sense of being touched by a singular embodiment of beauty in light of the coral root orchard, or, if nature is too far away, a captivating novel. If Rorty's account is convincing, has it not been precisely in modern, or sometimes you also call it the very long postmodern times, times in which the search for an ultimate ground is no longer necessary or even plausible, that innerworldly mysticism becomes possible. Free from the worship of gods uh, or reason, humans could see and be touched by the beauty of a singular orchid without regarding it as a symbol of something else, be it knowledge, morality, god, or ultimate um, reality. Rather than deducing a general rule 
a moral command or a divine message from such experiences, the modern mystic can open herself up to the singularity and uniqueness of experience. Whether it is possible for modern mystics to relate to allness, yaspas umfassendus, or the encompassing, is a different but also relevant question I would like to raise for Stephen. The second issue that Stephen brings up is that of mystical existence. Stephen suggests that mysticism creates inner citadels, places of inner retreat. This interpretation is confirmed by the etymological root of the concept of mysticism, muein, to close one's ears, mouth, and eyes, which suggests a turning inward. Steve maintains that mystical attitudes involve epistemological and existential dimensions, while he privileges the latter. Quote, if it has authentic standing at all, it can only be lived, end of quote. In what sense can mysticism be lived authentically? Asking for a manual for an authentic mystical existence is, of course, self-defeating. But it would be interesting to hear whether Steve thinks the insights that the mystic can attain harbor implication for an authentic form of outward existence. How does the drinking of the fountain of the inner citadel, the insight into an experience of nothingness, as Eckhart puts it, lead to a transformed existence. Stevens suggests that the mystic would be less of an agent and more of a patient. I take this to mean that the authentic mystic has learned to cultivate the capacity of letting go or letting be rather than holding on and acting. The agential registers of initiating and orchestrating give way to the passive competencies of letting be. What, in Stevens' opinion, is the mystic being opened up to in this transformation from an active to a passive register? Um, I would like to close here with a quotation from Jaspers. In Psychology of uh, Worldviews, Jaspers points to the dangers inherent in mystical passivity, which is part of mystical existence. Uh, and he writes, the emphasis on non-doing and passivity leads to a lack of responsibility. Not acting and irresponsibility seems self-evident to him. That's the mystic. I think that Jasper's question is still relevant for us today. Is authentic mystical existence desirable from a norm normative point of view? Thank you. So now we have a brief response from Stephen, and then we'll open to the floor. Uh, I confess that, uh, uh, among other things, though I don't think it's determinative, uh, I may be accused of having a certain nostalgia for being or for a way of uh, looking beneath and beyond the epistemological problems of the uh, modernity period and of its successors and aftermath. Uh, what I worry about is this, that if we escape or get too far away from foundationalism, the mysticism we find is going to get in the clutches of neuroscience. I think Dick Rorty's uh, views, uh, Dick and I can not often see things in the same way, uh, uh, the views about the wild orchids, uh, I think that's an aestheticizing of mysticism. And I suppose when I talk about a certain nostalgia for being, I'm suggesting that uh, what mysticism must be, if it is mysticism, is among other things, transformative. It's not just something one approaches as a uh, disciplined spectator or as someone that would be enjoyed by it. The last thing Mario says is very serious and it raises an enormous danger for, I think, most views of mysticism that would want to stress the undergoing uh, aspect, which makes one more patient than uh, agent, and that is without uh, any clear direction or guidance as to possible content, uh, terrible political things uh, can happen. And Jaspers uh, is very mindful of the fact that uh, from his point of view, and I think was the right one, uh, awful things happen because of a horrible and terrible charismatic, but evilly so, leader in Germany uh, during the time leading up to the sorts of remarks. Uh, uh, the Oscars made about this. There's a line uh, 
many lines along these lines you find in T.S. Eliot. He says, uh, what the discipline is, is to find out that you must hope without knowing what the object of hope is. Uh, mysticism without built-in criteria, I think, is a terribly dangerous thing. And uh, yet it's hard to know what alternative one might find with respect to it. So uh, I think Mario's put his finger on some very important material. Thank you. So we have time for uh, probably about two questions. All discussions so. of mysticism. Uh, it seems to me that we, we have the various ways the term is used. We need to be uh, clear uh, to uh, about a very different sense of uh, non-rational and something like extraordinarily experiential. Um, and um, I don't know, I, I, I sense some conflation in uh, uh, Stephen's presentation, and particularly in the notion of this, say, um, sensible encounter. I mean, in one way, the uh, sensible encounter as a um, analog to the immediacy of perceptual experience is, uh, I think, a very positive core of the experiential sense of mysticism. And then it is really an open question whether or not that can be foundational or not. I mean, in some traditions that emphasize this experiential sense of mysticism, uh, we have in, oh, in Indian philosophy, Nyaya, Yoga, uh, some schools of Vedanta, have the notion of the yogika pratyaksha that they make explicit analogy to perceptual experience as being um, foundational in the sense of in uh, testimony of a teacher to students and any any arguments one of the premises will be uh, will come from the special kind of experience though it is is realized that it's not literally perceptual is just an analogy to perceptual. And then in other traditions, it's thought, particularly the Buddhists that I mentioned earlier, um, know that uh, experiential uh, dimension can't be expressed in any words, uh, and uh, it's uh, definitely uh, not uh, foundational for any beliefs whatsoever. In fact, all beliefs get in the way. So that's just one example of how important it is to separate the two senses of the term uh, mystical, uh, at least these two senses, of the non-rational uh, and the something like extraordinarily experiential. Uh, with respect to sensible, I had meant sensible in that limited sense in which from, you know, uh, John Locke and Hume on into Kant's notion of what, what constitutes sensibility. I think it's a narrow conception of what we're capable of encountering. That's really all I had in mind there. Okay, we have time for one more short question. Go ahead. Um, it seems to me that uh, to, the, to the extent that mystical experience happen today in the West, they're happening outside of academia. And what, what, what uh, possibilities do you see to bring uh, the openness for mystical experience, even in philosophy, back to the philosophy, philosophy curriculum. I think that could be a practical political question uh, in one way, and that you're really asking, uh, from my point of view, how you would get uh, it further and further possible that, for example, courses might be offered uh, that explore this kind of material. From what I understand and the limited database I have, there's a growing interest in uh, continental philosophy. I could give some data about that, but if the data I have uh, uh, have any legs that will take us beyond what I happen to have learned, uh, uh, then I think there's going to be growing interest on the part of students taught for uh, these kind of explorations. And, what I know, which isn't a great deal about uh, religion departments, they tend uh, not to get into this as much as maybe would be nice, uh, but that opens the door for uh, philosophical possibilities. Uh, 
No, uh, having said that, I'm slightly pessimistic. I don't know that uh, institutionalization of philosophy makes terribly possible the kinds of explorations that I think you and I would like to see occur. Okay, let's uh, thank Stephen one more time. Our third and final speaker is Alexei Precision from Monash University. He'll be giving us a talk tonight on wonder and the discursive basis of Tugendhat's mysticism. On my view, uh, one of the things that's most interesting about egocentricity and mysticism, so it's Tugendhat's book, um, is the way that he manages to system systematically integrate a number of distinct concerns, um, beginning with a consideration of the basic competencies involved in saying something simple like I. Uh, Tugendhat develops an account of the good and a theory of recognitively structured action to show that mysticism and re religion are essential responses to the existential stresses that follow from our everyday engagements. So on Tugendhat's view, mysticism is actually a therapeutic enterprise um, that's directly connected to what it means to be human. Um, unlike religion, however, Tugendhat argues that mysticism offers a viable practice for attenuating the kinds of stresses that we encounter. Um, it offers us uh, what he calls peace of mind. Um, interestingly, Tugendhat suggests that a sense of wonder is crucial for this kind of mystical experience and for attaining peace of mind. Wondering at the existence of the world, so this is a Wittgensteinian theme, how astonishing that the world exists, um, uh, or being engrossed in the contemplation of a, a beautiful work of art, or indeed even an exceptionally elegant mathematical proof on Tugendhat's view, prompts us to put ourselves into perspective and mo momentarily relinquish the commitments informing our everyday lives. Now, for my part, I find myself oscillating between two competing reactions to Tugendhat's overall argument. Um, on the one hand, I find his, his philosophical anthropology, based on this idea of building out what the competencies required to say I happen to be, um, quite compelling. Um, on the other hand, I'm a little less impressed or persuaded by his account of mysticism, uh, in particular his account of wonder. Um, so in other words, it seems to me that Tugendhat's account of our propositionally structured deliberative capacities is actually at odds with the kind of skill, skilled coping he attributes to our experiences of wonder and hence the practices of mysticism itself. Um, it's not clear to me that the notion of wonder allows us to move from the discursively structured, the propositionally structured, to skilled coping in the way that Tugendhat requires. Um, so I find this to be a genuine puzzle. Uh, what I want to try to do um, is to see whether we can solve the puzzle together. Um, so to test whether wonder can support the move from deliberative activities engendered, that engender our existential concerns to the skilled coping Tugendhat articulates as the form of mystical engagement. Um, so to get this done, I'm going to sort of sketch out Tugendhat's philosophical anthropology, just as a way of contextualizing the argument, um, move on to a quick account of the notion of mysticism and the role that wonder plays in it for Tugendhat, and then sort of just air my confusions or worries. Um, so to get started, Let's look at Tugendhat's philosophical anthropology. Um, on his view, what distinguishes us from other species really just is the propositional structure of the language we speak. Um, that is, unlike the pragmatic modes of communication involved in the signal languages of other animals, the languages of bees, dogs, so forth and so on, um, our language, human language, involves an extra communicative uh, dimension. That is to say, in virtue of the propositions embedded in our communicative interactions, uh, a diver diverse range of deliberative practices and modes of evaluation become available to us. So we can wonder what would be better if certain things in the circumstances were changed, which is something that bees can't do because they can't consider counterfactual situations. That would require something like stable cross-contextual content. Signal languages don't have that. They simply have a notion of adequacy. Right? I can adequately respond to something in my environment, but I can't figure out what I would have done differently were the environment differently structured. Um, so we're able, for instance, to coordinate our basic commitments and track them across multiple contexts of action while reflecting on what would be better for us to do. We can also, as I just mentioned, consider counterfactual situations which an agent, in which an agent holds different commitments or acts differently and assess what would be better um, or whether the outcome of such actions would have been better or worse for that agent. Right? So again, the neat thing about propositional content is that it allows for these kinds of con counterfactual or subjunctive modes of evaluation assessment that we don't have otherwise. Um, the evaluative dimensions imply that a competent speaker implicitly recognizes herself first as participating in some kind of whole 
a universe of discourse and space of reasons, something that tracks and coordinates uh, possible modes of assessment given the same content. Um, and second, as necessarily occupying an epistemic register or perspective within this whole. So think of this as a kind of locus of deliberation and action coordination for an individual agent. Um, she takes herself as important in virtue of her basic commitments or others as important, coordinating all of these things together. This also implies, third, that the epistemic pri privilege that an ICR attaches to her perspective is still ontologically relative. Um, other perspectives or loci remain possible, and in the grand scheme of things, what one takes to be paramount is probably not so important after all. Um, Tugendhat thus characterizes what it means to be human, or as he would put it more precisely, to be an eye-sayer in terms of these capacities and concerns that follow from the way that we use propositionally structured language to situate ourselves within various spaces of reason and to deliber deliberate on what we should do. Uh, to simplify the account somewhat, these features prompt eye-sayers to dis deliberate on how one ought to live. Um, so. Uh, and to worry about the limited time one has to achieve the goals that one has selected in virtue of how one wants to live. So, on his account, reflecting on how one ought to live involves roughly three things. Um, in the first instance, we have to make sense of our individual perspective or standpoint, um, that is to say, the locus from which we deliberate and relate to one another um, via our concerns of the good. Second, we have to relate to ourselves as a whole, that is to say, past, present, and envisioned future self, and Third, we need to make sense of how one ought to live given our basic commitments that we've identified in the first two steps. Um, this process exhibits a, pecu a peculiar oscillation between the uniqueness or specificity of our first-person perspective and a third-person perspective that one may take up to assess one's plans and goals. You can think of this as either a God's eye or bird's eye view um, of the whole from which individual actors at a particular locus are deliberating. So again, there's a sense of the whole built out um, of the, the coordination of individual perspectives. A concern for this how of one's life, Tugendhat insists, is thus a direct consequence of an ICR's linguistic capacities and her effort to coordinate and situate herself within her context. And these, these efforts to make sense of oneself and do well for oneself or others leads ICRs to experience a unique form uh, of stress or anxiety. Right? So again, we've been building up all of these hows, how one ought to live, deliberative capacities, and they do generate certain kinds of epistemic uh, and moral stresses on us. Um, so the goal-directed activities and intersubjective modes of assessment made possible by context-independent contents thus intensify the burdens of deciding what to do and how best to do it. For not only can we envision a world in which we fail to completely accomplish what's important to us, um, we can also conceive of a world that gets on just fine without us in the first place. Um, for all our efforts to achieve something good and to be esteemed in our activities, um, our individual achievements look inconsequential from the perspective of the whole. Um, so in brief, it's going to turn out being an eye-sayer is uh, a fairly trust stressful kind of experience. Um, the concern for how we ought to live our lives, which, prompted, uh, which is prompted by our propositionally structured deliberations in the first place, intensifies the need to find a satisfying sense of the good. What, what um, the sense of achievement attenuates the kinds of stress built in the kinds of activities uh, we engage in. So the idea is that they're worthwhile because we've achieved something. Um, so we also want to find a way of making us uh, coming through these stresses and uh, uh, desires for certain forms of achievement while becoming acute, acutely aware that, as I said already, the world as a whole gets, gets on perfectly fine without us. Um, and in virtue of all of this, um, we seem to be moving between and trying to coordinate two distinct perspectives on our own lives. Right, again, first personal perspective and this third personal perspective of a systematically integrated set of possible loci of deliberation, a space of reasons, really. Um, this ability, Tugendhat contends, introduces a fairly, fa uh, fairly familiar phenomenological or existential concern. Um, the horizon of every eye-sayer's action and practical deliberation is the certainty of her eventual death. So this is what we're getting after. One of the reasons why our day-to-day -day engagements have a certain kind of existential register is because if we don't get them done now, we might not be able to do it later. And Tugendhat uses this to sort of introduce a, a broadly Heideggerian interpretation of anxiety in terms of death, uh, while moving away from the, the, the typical Heideggerian solutions to this problem. Um, so as Tugendhat puts it, we come to the realization or thought that I will die soon, but just not now. Um, the deliberative 
uh, and recognitive abilities made possible by propositional language then um, entail an anxiety concerning my death, and this anxiety is a necessary feature of our experience. So Tugendhat claims. Um, on Tugendhat's view, the anxiety in the face of an ever-present but non-imminent death is a cognitively dissonant experience brought on by the fact that we can take up these two contrary positions to evaluate our engagements. The next move in Tugendhat's argument um, is to say that I sayers, we humans, have come up with two strategies for coping with this kind of cognitive dissonance, namely religion and mysticism. And one of the neat parts of uh, Tugendhat's argument is the attempt to disarticulate or distinguish between religious practices of coping with the existential stresses that get thematized by my consideration of death and the mystical ones. Um, so as Tugendhat puts it, and this is a quote, the problem that religion and mysticism hold in common but solve in opposite ways is that of contingency. And again, the contingency here is just the contingency of my own personal position and the things that I take to be important. Um, so religion and mysticism develop specific practices for attenuating this cognitive dissonance uh, by targeting its source, namely the contingency or relativity of the first person perspective on the how of my life. Uh, but religion and mysticism differ on Tugendhat's view precisely with regard to the perspectives they insist agents adopt. So, the belief in a superhuman and personal entity, which Tugendhat takes to be constitutive of religion, insists on the first personal evaluative perspective and provides a set of practices aimed at helping us realize our respective and contingent senses of the good, while ensuring that the evaluative perspective on the whole of existence is filled by a being for whom we already matter. Right. So, this might be a caricature of religion, but it's certainly the view that Tugendhat ultimately are, uh, developed. Um, the practices defining mysticism, on the other hand, are intended to help I-sayers break free uh, of the first person evaluative perspective by relinquishing the very desires and drives, or at least putting, stepping back from them, attenuating the, the stresses they cause us, um, and learn to see things from the perspective of the universe as a whole. So as Tugendhat puts it, again this is a quote, historically humans have come up with two ways to alleviate the suffering of, uh, this condition of suffering. The path of mysticism consists in putting the weight of one's wishes into perspective or even denying them. This involves, he says, a transformation of one's self-conception. The path of religion, on the other hand, leaves the wishes as they are and undertakes instead a transformation of the world by means of wishful projection." End quote. Uh, so again, I want to bracket any concern for the accuracy of Tugendhat's consideration here. I think that's a really sort of straw man version of, I think, what religion's going to be trying to do. But for the sake of argument, let's just grant it to him. Um, what I want to do instead is unpack the contention that I've just sort of articulated. As I read it, Tugendhat made three basic claims. First, the essential difference between religion and mysticism is intrinsically bound up with the difference between the two evaluative perspectives we may adopt in virtue of our propositionally structured language. Right? Religion insists on my first person perspective and I change the world in order to facilitate the realization of my basic desires. Um, I do that by appeal to the big G upstairs. Um, Mysticism moves the other way as it attempts to help me relinquish features of my first person perspective that are the cause or source of my existential stresses in order to be able to become comfortable with the whole perspective um, that one can take on, on life in general. Um, second, he holds that the dissonance and anxiety caused by oscillating between a contingent first person perspective and a perspective on the grand scheme of things prompts I-sayers to develop specific practices for attenuating the anxiety. So again, uh, if it's religion, it's a reality-oriented set of practices that aim to transform the world so that, uh, so that it, re it reflects one's priorities and thus facilitates realizing one's goals, and a self-oriented practice that aims to relativize one's basic commitments in order to attenuate the stresses they cause. Third, these practices for achieving peace of mind double down on one perspective or the other. Um, so again, it's not that there's a new perspective offered, it's just that there's an emphasis uh, and a further insistence on one over the other. Um, that is, the practices themselves are intrinsically connected to one of the viewpoints I-sayers can take up. Hence, in light of the anxiety caused by oscillating between the two perspectives, I-sayers need to choose between them in order to, uh, to implement the practices for attaining peace of mind. Right, so it seems to be disjunctive and there doesn't seem to be any kind of way of doing both because the practices are connected to different perspectives. The perspectives themselves are what cause the kinds of existential stresses as we oscillate between them. Um, so this seems to introduce a problem for Tugendhat's account. On the one hand, 
He wants to say that mysticism involves relinquishing at least parts of our respective first-person perspectives in order to fully accommodate the context transcending super perspective of the universe as a whole so that we can achieve some kind of peace of mind. He also insists that the coherence of the super perspective depends upon the propositional language, which also entails the first person perspective we are trying to relinquish. So at first blush, it would seem that mysticism is a kind of self-defeating enterprise, since it's caught up in something like a performative con uh, contradiction. What one is being asked to relinquish for the sake of one's peace of mind provides the very means to relinquish it. Um, Tuganat is aware of the problem, and it actually informs his criticisms of some of the historical mystical traditions uh, that he takes up. So in particular, uh, certain forms of Buddhism, he thinks, end up getting caught in this kind of performative contradiction. So does Taoism. Um, it also explains why he introduces the notion of wonder. Um, from, uh, it's the experience of wonder, wonder to how things does not involve propositional content. Um, so the experience of wonder for Tugendhat provides us, again, with what should be a third way between um, the kind of performative contradiction that we find in certain forms of extant mysticism and the first person emphasis that we get from religious practices. Um, uh, so wonder purports to allow us to move from the deliberative and practical engagement defining our first personal experience to a situated kind of attention that brackets the existential stresses we typically encounter. And it is therefore able to offer eyesayers peace of mind while putting them in touch with the universe as a whole. Um, I don't find this line of argument particularly convincing. Uh, but before, uh, before I say more in this vein, I want to flesh out what Tugendhat's sense of wonder is and how it's supposed to work. Um, in effect, it functions in much the same way that the experience of beauty or the sublime does in a Kantian reflective judgment. Um, the experience of wonder presents us with a non-discursive content that becomes thematic when we take up a distinct cognitive orientation to the world, uh, which of course is irreducible to our epistemic, prudential, or moral concerns in general. Um, wonder, Tugendhat insists, is the awareness that one has found something incomprehensible. Uh, yet, unlike a mere per perplexity, so Tugendhat makes a difference between genuine senses of wonder and merely being perplexed by something, um, and a kind of a perplexity is just I encounter my own epistemic in ignorance, but in principle could find a reason for the thing that I find perplexing. So one of the things I've often wondered about or been perplexed by is, this, is a fly landing on the ceiling. Right? So it has to flip, right? and it has to flip without losing upward momentum. Right? I have no idea how this works. Um, I find it genuinely perplexing. But I could go online and find out what the mechanics behind this actually are, and thereby remove the perplexity. Um, Tugendhat thinks that wonder is actually the, uh, the experience one has when no reasons in principle can be given. Um, so wonder involves coming up against the limits of my ability to find reasons altogether. It's precisely this cognitive shift in perspective that's supposed to provide us uh, with the ability to move beyond ego, uh, our egocentric responsiveness to reasons and into a properly mystical mindset. So the first step really is the sense of wonder. Right? Um, now, that kind of wonder is the kind that we find, as Tugendhat writes, when we become so engrossed in something being true that our own egocentric position recedes into the background. Um, it can therefore be said to be any proposition of the form, how astonishing that A exists. Um, and this proposition points to the mystical. Um, so I said I didn't find much of this convincing. Let me try to explain why in like the minute I've got left. Um, if I've understood him correctly, what we've got is this non-discursive uh, form of skilled coping, this wondering at the edge or at the limit of my ability to give reasons. Um, and that, because it's on the, the limit, it is supposed to avoid the performative contradiction I introduced a little while ago. Um, um, my sense, however, is that this move actually shifts the goalposts of Tugendhat's general discussion. Um, all of a sudden, we now possess another ability over and above the ones that were supposed to define us as eyesayers, namely the competencies and capacities involved in using indexical and deictic expressions, um, to this new form of situated coping um, that hasn't been mentioned before. Moreover, the ability to become engrossed, which is a non-propositional mode of attending to things in our environment, needs to be connected to the competencies and forms of deliberation made possible by propositional language. Um, and it needs to be connected to our propositionally structured capacities because it presupposes the kinds of totalities that Tugendhat had initially reserved for propositional language use. So the idea, again, is that the wonder that I have 
is a wonder of, of at the whole of things, which was made thematic simply by the systematic integration of possible perspectives and deliberative abilities, right? So that's the whole that we're putting in contact with. So there's got to be some kind of connection and difference between wonder and the rest of my propositionally structured language use. Um, so I understand why that's there. Um, I don't see how to not actually builds that relationship. So other than asserting it, I don't know how we got there. Um, so uh, it would also mean that for most of my life, I've never had uh, a genuine experience of wonder, um, precisely because of the fact that I can seem to give good reasons for what I wonder at, though they're not epistemic, prudential, or moral. Right? So I don't understand why the sense of wonder that Tugnot introduces has to be this one at the limit of reason giving as such. It seems to be at the limit of a certain kind of reason, but not of reason in general. Uh, and I don't understand how that move was made. Um, finally, right, because uh, yeah, I really do want to get to the conversation. That's always the most interesting part. Um, I'm genuinely curious uh, to understand why, if what we've got is something like uh, a Kantian reflective judgment as being the model for wonder, which is supported by the, uh, Tugendhat's own discussion of Rudolf Otto's discussion of the, of the, uh, of the numinous, um, why reflective judgments, if, so if it really is a form of reflective judgment, um, and that reflective judgment thereby provides us with the appropriate analog for understanding the experience of wonder, uh, why does wonder not in fact strengthen or intensify our egocentricity? Right? Something like Kant thought that, um, that reflective judgment actually strengthens our cognitive faculties, and in the experience of the sublime, strengthens our own sense uh, of self because we are able to make the chaotic intelligible. Right? So it's not clear to me that the, 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 the very nature of wonder can do the job that Tugnot suggests it does, which is to relativize our first-person perspective, because it's equally plausible that the same wonder actually intensifies our first-person perspective, because I find this astonishing. Right? And again, for Kant, the, what is it, the third moment of the judgment of taste is that the communicability if I find it wonderful or astonishing, I should be able to show you that too. Um, and I don't see why um, that doesn't involve a kind of, again, reintegration of the first person perspective. Um, and I'll stop there. So thank you very much. So Mario, once again, is going to give us some brief comments on this before we have some time for discussion. I just um, so in his insightful reflections on Tugendhat's mysticism, Alexei uh, wonders about wonder. He is not alone in this regard. In a recent review of egocentricity and mysticism, Ursula Renz writes, strangely though, Tugendhat concludes with a short and lovely chapter on the phenomenon of wonder, where, among other things, he argues that Descartes was right in positing an emotion that is not reducible to our concern with things insofar as they are good or bad for us, but insofar as they exist. We wonder that something exists and not simply about what it is or how it might or might not be useful for our concerns. Yet, and here comes the strange part, in wonder we depart, or so it seems at least, from propositional language use. In his reconstruction, Alexei argues that, quote, Tugendhat's account of our propositionally structured deliberative cap capabilities is at odds with the kind of skilled coping he attributes to our experience of wonder. Alexei diagnoses a, quote, performative contradiction. The, su the super perspective of an allness, or what Jospas would have called the encompassing dimension, would provide peace of mind in freeing us from the existential stresses connected to being egocentric isayers. Propositional language allows us to abstract from our concrete context, while it also condem condemns isayers to remain bound to the egocentric predicament. Wonder is supposed to solve or resolve this tension, since wonder does not rest or for Tugendhat at least, does not rest on propositional content and thereby promises to overcome or at least alleviate the existential stresses connected to this egocentric predicament. Um, so my question to Alexei is then, could you clarify in what sense wonder relates to a form of non-discursive skilled coping, as you put it? What does the person who experiences wonder cope with and in what sense 
Does the biking example uh, that I think you jumped over uh, in the presentation now, uh, biking is one form of um, uh, coping which is not discursively structured, but Alexei argues that um, it is uh, open to reason giving. Um, so in what sense is, is this example illustrative of what wonder is? Granted, the biker is immersed in an automated skill, but does he really experience wonder? The person who wonders that something exists does usually, or at least not necessarily, perform an automated skill like bike riding and even less so one of coping. Rather than being linked to a skill, wonder seems connected to forms of meditative immersion of the kind we find when turning to works of art or being amazed by the very existence of another person. And I take it that it's very interesting that in this chapter on wonder is the only place where the second person perspective comes up, which uh, Tugendhat always talks about the first person perspective, the egocentric um, predicament and how we get out of it. But the entire book and many critics have criticized this. He doesn't really take seriously the second perspective, but here it comes up because most of the examples he chooses are us wondering about the existence of other persons. Um, as Alexei states, there are parallels between wonder and aesthetic experience. The person who wonders is taken out of the typical forms of relating to the world by way of employing skills, including the skill of making use of propositional language. This does not mean that mystics would reject language in favor of silence. What it does suggest is that what is at stake in the mystical attitude cannot be reduced to reasoning or imparting information by way of propositional language. This is suggested by mystical practices. An overcoming of language by means of language we find, for example, in Zen Buddhism's employment of koans or the meditative recitation of phrases that seek to break open the spell of propositional language from within, as it were. The self-transcendence of language by means of language is also present in paradoxical statements both denying and affirming language use. Thus, the Tao Te Ching, um, one of the reference points for Tugendhat, famously begins with the paradox, the Tao that can be spoken of is not the real or the eternal Tao. Similarly, the other Taoist classic, Zhuangzi, um, we can find the paradox of the fishnet allegory. The fish trap exists because of the fish, and I quote, um, once you've gotten the fish, you can forget the trap. The rabbit snare exists because of the rabbit. Once you've gotten the rabbit, you can forget the snare. Words exist because of meaning. Once you've gotten the meaning, you can forget the words. Where can I find a man who has forgotten words so that I may have a word with him? These examples could be read as performative contradictions, as Alexei argues. If so, they seem to, um, to me, they seem to be a virtuous rather than vicious contradiction, um, at least from the perspective of mysticism. Another important issue that Alexei raises is the parallel structure of wonder and the sublime. While there are many parallels between experiencing wonder and being confronted by the sublime, I wonder where Alexei would situate their differences. While the sublime, sublime reconfirms the subject's moral authority over an otherwise terrifying nature, wonder does not, or at least not necessarily, have the self-confirming dimension. Wonder is usually directed outward, and it is this outward directedness that can lead to a decentering for Tugendhat. Another difference seems to me to consist in the respective objects of the sublime on the one hand and wonder on the other hand. The sublime, at least in Kant's dynamic sublime, is associated with the experience of vastness, especially the vastness of nature which we cannot grasp. Tugendhat's account of wandering, on the other hand, draws on examples of persons or artworks such as Rembrandt's portraits that make us wonder at the possibility of the existence of somebody or something. Alexei objects to the idea that the person who experiences wonder goes beyond the practice of reason giving. It is hard to deny that the giving and asking for reasons can be sparked by a sense of wonder. Ideally, wonder triggers a sense of curiosity and has been claimed to be the beginning of philosophy. We might think of an 
Uh, we might also think of an astrophysicist who marvels at the vastness of the universe and the existence of seemingly infinite stars and will be inspired to engage in observations and conduct experiments to solidify his theories. However, as important as the latter discursive practices are, wonder cannot be fully captured by them. While there are important discursive practices such as deliberation about reasons usually come too early or too late. Also, they tend to be directed at questions of explanation and justification rather than amazed pondering on the very existence of something. Discursive knowledge may depart from or intensify a sense of wonder, but it cannot exhaust it. Just as experiences of beauty, wonder can be shared, but not by making inferences. Um, I take my amazement about the atmospheric density of the sunset to be universal as Alexei mentioned in reference to the third moment in the analytic of the beautiful. Um, however, this reflective judgment is not based on the application or generation of concepts or rules. My judgment entails the expectation that other people ought to experience the sunset as beautiful or worthy of admiration or worthy of wonder. But there are no universal or even contextual reasons that could make such judgment and their corresponding attitudes necessary. Finally, Alexei suggests uh, that wonder might not perform um, the overcoming of egocentricity um, that Tugendhat uh, hopes it can perform. The egocentric predicament is never fully left behind. One reason for this is that the sense of wonder cannot be sustained infinitely as much as it can be intensified and deepened. Experiences of wonder can throw us back onto ourselves, for example, when wondering about our capacity to wonder. However, even such reflexive forms of wondering leave the mystic in a transformed state of mind. The mode of self-reference of someone who has experienced profound wonder is transformed. Wonder might not get rid of, but it can, be tamed, it can tame epistemic pretensions. The person who wonders about the thatness of the world, or more plausibly, a certain phenomena, object, or person in that world, undergoes a process of decentering. Rather than marveling at his own egocentric predicament, he encounters other phenomena that are significantly larger, or smaller, or otherwise rather different uh, from him and his perspective. At the same time, he learns to see these phenomena as distantly familiar and that they too present viable perspectives on the world. Seeing both the limits and thereby a bit beyond the limits of the egocentric way of seeing the world allows the mystic to become attentive to this difference as a motivation to correct the egocentric pretensions of being the only or even a central perspective on reality. Thank you. So we have Enough time for one question or comment if someone has something that they can express briefly. Well, I'm wondering, goodness gracious, if the only way that you can actually think about wonder is if you think about infinity and like in the sense of like maybe the God himself or like in the Christian, Judeo Christian question of like God himself just creating a lot of people. What Tugendhat ends up doing is um, stipulatively differentiating between. Uh, uh, related but still conceptually distinct uh, kinds of cognitive engagement. So it's going to be the case that uh, things like perplexity really just are a recognition that epistemically I'm ignorant about how something works. Right? Um, wonder, however, is supposed to push it to the point where in principle the kinds of things that I'm attending to are not the kinds of things I can give, answer, give reasons for. Right? So for Hegel, I think ultimately you can give reasons for God. So you can be perplexed by God, but it's still something within, within the ken of reason giving. Right? Um, Wittgenstein wants to say that, you know, I can, one, I, I can find it uh, astounding that there is a world. But then ha Wittgenstein hastens to say, that's still not a, a meaningful kind of thing to say. Why? Because, well, it's going to turn out that um, you can only wonder at things that could be true or false. Right? And that's Wittgenstein's point, right? So wondering at a necessary condition is not something you can really do, right? Um, so for him, there's a kind of cognitively dissonant structure to wonder, right? Um, Tugnot just pushes that a little bit further and says, well, yeah, this kind of engrossed uh, attending to 
allows me to have that kind of experience that's meaningful because the thing that I'm attending to could not have been there, right? Um, and yet it's something that doesn't simply um, amount to me being perplexed because there's no reason I can give for it. So with that, we need to draw this to a close. Thank you all for attending.